On this episode of Art Loft, we're at the MOCA, where they're celebrating the Afro-Cobra movement with the groundbreaking exhibition, Afro-Cobra, Messages to the People. And we head to Fort Lauderdale to the Fat Village for a new take on the concept of dwelling. It's a multi-artist experience called Inhabited. Then we check out horror bodies at the Murakami, a contemporary take on the ancient art of Japanese lacquerware. It's all ahead on this episode of Art Loft. Art Loft is brought to you by Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. The Miami-Dade County Tourist Development Council, the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade County Mayor, and the Board of County Commissioners, and by the Friends of South Florida PBS. Hi, I'm Jamani Anamdi. And I'm Lolo Reskin, and from the MoCA in North Miami, this, this right here, this is Art Law. Hello. I'm Jamani Anamdi, and I'm here at the Museum of Contemporary Art in North Miami with Shauna Sheldon. She is the museum director, and we're checking out an exhibit highlighting the 50th anniversary of the Afro Cobra Black Artist Collective. This exhibit now was brought together by the founders of the movement and their work from then until now. Let's start with what does Afro Cobra mean? Afro-Cobra is the African commune of bad, relevant artists. They are a collective that came out of Chicago in the late 60s, at a time where there weren't so many positive imagery of African Americans. And they came together to create positive artwork. There were five founders, and five more joined them later on in 1970 to have their first exhibition together at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And the exhibition starts with that as a starting point. They were the first group of their kind to do this with a manifesto. So they actually wrote out what their goals were. And this included using these bright, what they called Kool-Aid colors that you'll see throughout the exhibition, the use of text to make sure that their messaging was very clear, as well as positive images of African Americans. So they were parallel with the civil rights movement? How did that work? Exactly. This was happening at the same time as the black power movement. Mm -hmm. And the collective were really a part of helping define the black arts movement and the visual aspects of it. The movement is from Chicago, but we're showing it in North Miami. One of the reasons we worked with the curator, Jeffrey and Hayes, who's from Chicago, is that her work is very much about community. There is an area of the exhibition that brings us back home to here to Miami. We collaborated with History Miami and the Black Archives to present a series of black and white photographs of Miami in the late 60s so we could see some of the topics that are very present in Afrocobra's work, what was happening in Miami right, at that time. Right. We even have an area where visitors can write their own notes and their own memories that we're archiving. Huh. Each of the rooms of the exhibitions, they're divided into themes. So in each area, there's different topics that are being talked about, everything from the idea of black family and the position of the woman in the black family and in the community, to music, rhythm, spirituality. So every part of the exhibition is a different experience. This room um, is really focused on the five original founding artists okay. that started Afrocobra. Uh, this artist, Gerald Williams, you can see his palette changed a bit over the years that got a little bit more pastel -y. and he was in the military and traveled a lot so that started affecting the way that he was making work. Both of the pieces on this wall are Wadsworth who also was pretty experimental in, in his materials and in the work that he was creating and you can see throughout the exhibition we used the Afrocobra colors on the walls which was something that was happening right. with the artists throughout their years of exhibiting. 
doing their work. One of the parts of the exhibitions that I really love is that you're seeing multimedia throughout the space. So there's artwork by Barbara Jones Hogu who used the screen print and that was very intentional. Screen prints are easily reproducible. The artwork was about unifying the community, communicating messages so and, and everybody could get one. Right. Exactly. Nice. And someone like Jay Jarrell who is using garments in her work, she was actually a fashion designer. Again, the garment was something that she could create and put out there in the world. So she was sharing the messages and the ideas of Afrocobra. This is a beautiful piece and really captures so much of the work of Jay that was more sculptural than any of the other Afrocobra artists. Right. So this particular piece uh, exemplifies her shop. She's always a, a working, independent a woman, designer, a right? fashion designer, and transforms these paintings into sculptural, three-dimensional objects. And I but, see this is from 94, so that shows that she was continuing to work after the exactly. six, late 60s. She, so are these artists still working? Eight of the 10 exhibiting artists are still with us. Seven of them were here in Miami for the opening during Art Basel Miami beach in 2018 so the artists want everyone to know they haven't stopped making work right. they started in the late 60s and they have not stopped and one of the great parts of this exhibition is really understanding that the ideas that these artists are talking about are exploring are putting out into the world are just as relevant today as they were when they were making them so you think it even parallels with like the black lives movement absolutely I think that these are artists that we can look back to now and really understand where some of this positive imagery is coming from, these ideas about unification and community and empowerment. We originated this exhibition here. And it's going to be traveling? We are very excited to share that the narration of this show is going to be presented as part of the Venice Biennale this really? year. It's really an honor to be able to have this conversation here at MoCA North Miami. The Museum of Contemporary Art North Miami's mission is to bring contemporary art to a diverse community and specifically underserved communities. We envision MoCA as a cultural hub that embraces the diversity of our dynamic city and want to be a place where people can come and see a reflection of themselves in our shows and in our programs. For our next piece, we head up to Fort Lauderdale's Fat Village for a new look at the concept of dwelling by the C3 Collective. Curators challenged 16 artists to change the way that people perceive places they can inhabit. Let's take a look. I'm Lisa Rockford, one of the three curators for the exhibit Inhabited here at Fat Village Projects. This is actually the inaugural exhibition for the C3 Collective, which stands for Contemporary Curator Collective. One of the goals of C3 Collective is actually to have shows in alternative spaces and to break that mold of the traditional gallery format, how we can activate those spaces in a new way. When you have pieces that are meant to be interacted with, several people almost become like actors in the exhibit, and so the audience becomes like part of the work as well. We gave a directive to to the selected artists to create some type of structure or dwelling. Those different diverse representations became sort of a village uh, for the exhibit. My name is Martin Casuso and this is my piece, uh, Biscayne Bay Fort But Knit. My inspiration was the, my childhood. I grew up in uh, down south near the Biscayne Bay and Coconut Grove. So this is my version of a fort based on my youthful remembrances, but using the materials as I use as an adult. I work with found objects and knits and I make knit things and I love textiles. I love the history of them and I love the fact that craft is now really being accepted as a material that fine art can be made of. The boards themselves that cover the structure are made using a little knitting machine that was designed in the 70s for little girls to learn how to knit. Thrift store objects are wonderful because they have a history of their own, but they're not your history. But they're sort of a, they're things that you can touch upon that are familiar, but they're also by somebody you'll never know. And a big part of buying things at thrifts that I found fascinating was that somebody spent a lot of time making these for their family. The piece is made up of a lot of previous projects. So this is the first time that I've actually put it all together in one funny little space. I'm half Cuban, half Dutch. My father had to come here after Castro. My mother was a completely foreign country. So I always identify with 
outsiders or those that aren't really part of the main group. And these objects to me are that kind of thing as well. They're like discarded, they're slightly embarrassed or embarrassing, and therefore I love them. So I like bringing them together and trying to create something that's my own with them. My name is Donna Haynes. I'm an interdisciplinary artist, and this is my installation at the Inhabited Exhibit. The title of this piece is called Portrait of the Artist. I went into this piece, I think, a little bit differently as I was thinking about inhabited as a space inside of yourself or in your mind. This is how I envision uh, my mind uh, or an artist's mind or anyone who really has inspiration and when that creativity really hits how I think our mind probably looks and I have this metaphor that it looks like this beautifully intricate lace pattern that really is that blooming of creativity that comes out of our minds. It was important for the outside to be um, very different and blank, almost a blank slate. And when you go inside, you see more of the designs, the ideas. And definitely, I made a distinctive choice to use paper because it is so fragile. And I think that it really speaks to how fragile you know, we are, our ideas, we are vulnerable. And the sketchbook pages that are actually laser cut and the images start with an actual uh, brain synapse, uh, the image of one coming into the lace. And inside there's also a couple doors. And in those doors you can also look inside of the structure and there's a little video of vignettes in there. And in that video vignette, it's kind of a loop of an artist coming up with an idea. The candle comes on, the light comes on, we have a little uh, vignette of that idea and then we blow the candle out uh, because definitely creativity comes in spurts and some ideas are good, some ideas aren't. I went through 10 years of sketchbooks. It took a lot of courage at some point to make the decision to do it but I, I think it makes it authentic, you know, and, and, uh, and I want people to, to see that, that side. Some of the artists interpreted that in a socio-political way, thinking about issues of homelessness or immigration even. Some artists are thinking about it in a very personal way, thinking about their own homes and their past dwellings. Some people are thinking about the social space, where uh, the space can have several people inhabit it and create their own community within the space. And yet other artists were thinking about activating the space around them and responding to a site-specific interpretation of creating a dwelling. The Curator Collective, one of our goals is to unify the Tri-County area of South Florida of Broward, Palm Beach, and Miami-Dade. So we invite artists from the three counties as well as we hope to curate shows within those three counties as well. To learn more about Fat Village and all of their projects, check out the website below. And East Asia lacquerware -like has been prized for its sheen and lustrous beauty for centuries. But since the late 1980s, a group of lacquer artists have been taking their techniques to new heights. Palm Beach County's Murakami Museum and Japanese Garden has a look at these dynamic large-scale sculptures. Check it out. My name is Carla Stansifer. I'm the curator of Japanese art at the Murakami Museum and Japanese Gardens. Today we'll be talking about hard bodies, contemporary Japanese lacquer sculpture. This exhibit is actually on loan from the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and we feature 16 contemporary artists. Uh, we have at least one piece from each of the artists in the show, and they have a wide variety, as you can see, of textures, styles, and techniques that they use. Lacquer is an extremely versatile material. You can do so much with it in the right hands of someone who's skilled and understands the material. I think the most important thing I want people to know is that these artists, they come from a very long lineage, a very long tradition. And all of the artists are very aware of that. They honor that tradition, but yet they're doing completely new and innovative things. Each of the pieces, they are coated with lacquer, and I should say that lacquer can coat just about anything. Paper, bone, wood, metal, shark skin, it can be coated on anything and it will protect 
that substance, but it has to go through a curing process. It's not a drying process where you'd be removing humidity. They actually put it into a container where you add heat and you add moisture and then it cures, the catalyst, the chemistry takes over and it creates this wonderfully hardened surface that protects it from heat, electromagnetic rays, bacteria, uh, all kinds of things. This is a really fun piece. This is a piece by the artist Someya Satoshi. Uh, he's one of the younger artists in the show and he had a smaller version of this bowl and the collector, uh, Willard Clark, saw it and as it happens, Mr. Clark was a cattleman by trade and so he saw the small bowl, he fell in love with it and he said, can you make another one for me and make it bigger? So he did and uh, it's a really lively, fun piece. It has a lot of pictorial imagery and I think a lot of visitors like to come and, and look at this piece. Everyone sees something a little bit different. Love the variety. He's, uh, the artist is really blending imagery from east and west. We have some things uh, here. A good example is the moo that you see in English. And up above it says mo, which is what the cow says in Japanese. So uh, again, right there, he's showing that he's, he's trying to reach out to the audience on both sides. This piece is by an artist, Aoki Chie, and she's a really great provocative artist. She's up and coming, and in this piece, she's chosen to go back to the eighth century for some of her inspiration. During the Nara period in Japan, there was a long, well-established tradition of creating portraits out of lacquer of famous monks and teachers of the Buddhist tradition. And also the decoration, you look at this moire pattern that she has, uh, it looks very modern and contemporary, but that also goes back to the 8th century. I think a really good example of the environmental aspects of these pieces comes from the work by Fujita Toshiaki. And what he does is he creates these pieces by adding the unrefined lacquer. He adds one layer a day for two years. So he essentially grows these pieces much like a mollusk or tree bark. And it's interesting to me when we look at lacquer as a material, lacquer was usurped by the introduction of plastics, and now with a lot of what's going on environmentally, we need to steer away from plastics. We may be coming back to lacquer as a more utilitarian product. This piece is by Kurimoto Natsuki. One of the things I love about this piece, it's called Dual Sun, and the use of shell inlay or raden, as it's called in Japanese, uh, is highlighted here. And you can see the different shades of shell as you go through the piece. Uh, and the different colors tell you where the shell comes from. This piece is called Undercurrents 2009-2. It's by an artist called Matsushima Sakurako, one of the female artists represented in the show. And uh, this piece, I love it. She does a lot of wearable art. She started off in metal, and as her pieces got larger, they were a little more unwieldy, so she shifted to lacquer, which is really light, deceptively light. Uh, if you were to pick these pieces up, you would see, you'd be surprised how light they are. I also just love the beauty of these pieces. They're so wonderful. Uh, they're so innovative, and yet they're linked to the tradition, thousands of years of tradition that the artists are very aware of and honoring, but they're doing it in new and unique ways. Even though MTV's heyday is long gone, music videos are still as popular as ever. Here's a new one, Made in Miami, from a local artist called Rick Moon, and the song is Cracker Jack. Here's a special treat. Earlier in our season, we visited Jay Jackson's excellent dance residency at Young Arts. Him and his team gave a special performance just for our audience. Let's go check it out.
We like to see sex and gender, biology and the social as complements, snuggled together like cold feet. In truth, they are ways of learning, ways of seeing, technologies. Gender is machine, a snake laying back, swallowing its own tail. Gender is animal, feeding on expression and expelling control. Down to its mechanical guts, gender is a groping thing, a doesn't know how to be tender thing. Gender is biology unsexed, made bland on the tongue. Gender is a tangle unwound, not a string, but a loop with a glitch swung out from its farthest edge. And my flesh and my flesh is glowing, growing. Thanks for joining us on Art Loft. Me and Lolo are so happy you joined us on this amazing tour of all these cool places from the MoCA to Murakami Museum to Fat Village. Man, Lolo, this exhibition though really is with me. I'm really feeling this. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. The fact that it's headed to the Venice Biennale is amazing. And there's so much to see, such important work. Yeah, yeah. Hey, what did you guys like? Yeah, let us know. Connect with us anytime online on social media at Art Loft SFL. For Art Loft, I'm Lolo Reskin. And I'm Jamani Anamdi. Now remember, art imitates life, so do what? Live a beautiful life. Peace. Art Loft is brought to you by Where there is freedom, there is expression. The Florida Keys and Key West. The Miami-Dade County Tourist Development Council, the Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs, and the Cultural Affairs Council, the Miami-Dade County Mayor, and the Board of County Commissioners and by the Friends of South Florida PBS.